Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. This is Chris, and I'd like to invite you to this conversation about Kundalini and devotion. And uh, before we get started, I would like to welcome uh, Aaron Santara from Ireland. Hello, Aaron. Hello, Chris. If there's anything that you would like to announce at the beginning of the show, please do so. Uh, well, thank you. I would like to announce about the Kundalini Awakening Retreat that will be held in Santa Rosa. Um, this is going to be held on Saturday, April the 20th, and Sunday, April the 21st, and it's going to be led by yourself by Chrism. So some of you already know about this, and with only six weeks to go, we are now taking deposits. So if you would like to secure a place on the retreat, you can phone Eileen or you can write to me. Eileen's phone number is 239-246-5608, or you can write to me at Kundalini Matters at gmail.com, and we can let you know um, how to forward the deposit. Um, Again, the cost of the retreat is €200, and it is happening in Santa Rosa on April the 20th and April the 21st. So thank you. I think I think that's that's enough for now. Maybe I could again give out the details later towards the end of the show, Chrism. Okay. All right. Thank you, Erin. Uh, I, and I I would want to to put in that that'll be April the 20th and the 21st, 2013. Uh, for those of you listening in the archives, and I would like to to thank all of you who are listening in the archives. Uh, uh, in, in the future, from the time that this is now being broadcast, you're going to hear a phone ringing in the background. Please, no worries. It's, it's another phone line that we have here. Uh, so I would like to let uh, let the listeners know that there are other areas where you can receive some of this Kundalini information. And one of those websites is called uh, Kundalini Awakening Seminars dot com. Uh, another website is Kundalini Awakening Systems One dot com, and that's the the numeral one. If you're on Yahoo, you can you can reach a, a, a Kundalini community we have there at Kundalini Awakening Systems One at Yahoo Groups dot com, and then we have uh, multiple multiple communities on Facebook and the Facebook's uh, one is called Kundalini Awakening Systems 1 at Facebook and then there's another one Kundalini with an apostrophe Kundalini Awakening apostrophe and then there's another one Kundalini Ashram a Kundalini Ashram and uh, feel free to join any of those communities for additional Kundalini uh, Awakening information we also have one on Google+, Plus, which once again is called Kundalini Awakening Apostrophe. So today's conversation uh, is about Kundalini and devotion. This really is one of the most important of our conversations. Uh, devotion is, is a huge uh, huge level of importance within the Kundalini Awakening. Devotion, as I am uh, describing it to you within a Kundalini context, is about giving yourself in love to the Kundalini. And this includes, you know, a, a loving form of worship, a loving form of surrender, a loving form of unity with the divine that is that is awakening within you by virtue of the kundalini devotion is it's one of the most uh, beautiful and enjoyable and vibrant aspects of a of a kundalini awakening experience uh it 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 can set the tone for how your development within the kundalini is going to proceed but it also it, it can bring about a balance and some amelioration of some of the, the more challenging aspects 
of a Kundalini awakening event. Devotion, as I'm describing it here, is is a way of giving yourself into the Kundalini without any resistance. Without any resistance, you you agree to become at one with this this amazingly powerful force within you. And that force will respond to the gift of yourself, into it. And and some of this is, is really beyond words. Um, one, one of the equations is the two that become one and the one that becomes two. Well, when you when you go into to serene devotion with the kundalini, you become one with that divine aspect of of yourself, but also of God. Kundalini and the divine are intricately connected. I, this is where words start to fail. Uh, you become at one with the level of oneness that your human mind and brain can conceptualize. Uh, and even that is severely expanded within the within a kundalini awakening event such as a spinal sweep or you know some of these areas. Uh, when you have a spinal sweep and you are at one with all creation, well it literally means that it in to some degree you can feel that connectivity to every leaf or twig or animal or creation that that has been uh given and so but you know all of this within the limited resources of the of the human ability to find reference points for uh there's far more creation than our brains and our and our personalities can recognize as 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 being something that you can find reference for. Devotion allows for this oneness to be given. Devotion allows for a reception of Kundalini without uh resistance. Devotion is a form of, of exalted love for the Kundalini and, and and the many vectors from where the Kundalini will come to you in your life. Uh, for those of you who who are, you know, in the populations, and you know, you you may have a family, a job, a, a career, friends, uh, and you have, and you just happen to have the Kundalini as well. Well, the devotion would be from you to that Kundalini within you, and it's it's. It's easier to conceptualize when you have some of the attendant phenomena, the kriyas, or or seeing some of the light uh, phenomena that comes your way, the the audio phenomena that can come your way, the tactile phenomena that can occur. Uh, you can attribute that to the kundalini, and you always go for that. Uh, you never, ever listen to a discarnate entity saying, oh, I am your kundalini, you shall pray to me. You know, you just kind of, Look at that and then just ignore it. Change that channel. Um, Kundalini won't necessarily come through the offices of a discarnate entity. However, it can come through the offices of a teacher. If you happen to have a teacher who perhaps gave you Shaktipat or perhaps uh, uh, you have discovered along the the path that your Kundalini has been uh, leading you on, well, that person, provided they do actually have the awakened kundalini, that person you can give devotion to uh, as a way of targeting the outside to the inner and the inner to the outer. As above, so below. As below, so above. Uh, some of you may have heard that, that ancient equation. And as long as uh, you know the teacher is approachable in that way, or the guru... You know, uh, another word for teacher is guru in the Sanskrit language. Uh, this you can do, and, and, it, and if any of you are familiar with some of the Eastern practices, uh, you'll notice that giving devotion to a guru uh, is is not uncommon. Touching the foot of a guru is not uncommon, and it is a way of showing respect 
uh, to the kundalini or to the divine essence that is flowing, actively flowing through that teacher into the person who is who is touching the feet or who is sitting at the feet of the guru. Uh, this is not considered a weakness or a capitulation or anything that the West, you know, in, in, a, in an ego presumption might might uh, associate with this activity. Uh, devotion to a teacher is the equivalent of devotion to the kundalini. And it, in many ways, it's helpful to do it this way because you have a, a, a human form reception of kundalini. So the kundalini is flowing from them into you. Your kundalini is flo- flowing to them from you. And so there is a definite uh, interbraiding of, of communication that occurs. Uh, far more so than you would, say, praying to a statue or giving your devotion to a statue or giving your devotion to um, something that would be considered of an inanimate quality. Although, you know, when you when you look at the world through Kundalini eyes, you see everything is animate. Everything has a level of consciousness. Um, so giving your devotion to a teacher is appropriate. But just, you know... Uh, pick your teacher wisely or allow the kundalini to pick your teacher for you, which is really within a kundalini context is what happens for the most part with people, is their kundalini will guide them to a teacher. And then it will be up to their ego to, you know, up, up to the, the student's ego to either be, a, you know, severely retrained or becomes, you know, severely expressive. And typically, if the ego becomes severely expressive, uh, the devotion is negated and, and discontinued, and that student and teacher will probably part ways. Uh, if the person is willing to control their ego and, and uh, you know, work towards uh, creating a, a scenario where the ego is no longer calling the shots in the, in the person's life, well, then that student and teacher will probably continue and flourish and, and uh, uh, various uh, levels of, of experience within the kundalini will, will perpetuate themselves through that communication. Uh, so you can give devotion to a teacher, a human living teacher. Uh, giving devotion to a dead teacher is also possible. Uh, you'll have plenty of people in the Eastern context who are praying to uh, uh, teachers who have died. Some of them died thousands of years ago, and, and people can give uh, their devotion to those teachers as well. Um, I have found that the living teachers tend to have a little more of, a, of, a, of an energetic push than the dead teachers, but the dead teachers can also visit a person, uh, you know, in the, uh, as a... As a as a vision, uh, plenty of Kundalini people are visited by Jesus or or uh, Ramakrishna or Vivekananda or any any uh, any of the various uh, uh, Hindu-based uh, teachers that have come. And so, yeah, it, it's quite possible for a, for a person to be visited by the the deity or the teacher that uh, that the, that is most appropriate to them. So you can give devotion in that way. Uh, Most of the time with the kundalini, because it is such a tactile uh, experience, whenever you feel that that energetic load in the spine or the or the uh, often often the the kundalini energy will collect in a certain area, uh, energizing that area for a time. Uh, From that tactile point, you can begin to give your devotion into that tactile point. So let's just say that the uh, the energy starts to collect at the throat. Well, then you give devotion to the kundalini and thank it for being at the at the throat and and have that 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 uh, elevated gratitude and and um, devotion for the kundalini as it works that area of your body for for its infusion and transformation of your body, your whole body. But devotion. Uh, inside of a kundalini context, you'll you'll often 
find yourself brought to your knees, uh, brought to your knees in prayer or in worship. And this this happen, this can happen to you while you're just alone in the house, alone in 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 you know wherever you are wherever you are practicing or recognizing the Kundalini. And I will suggest, as a general practice, that you become devotional and that you do not be afraid to to prostrate yourself to the Kundalini. And whatever symbol works for you, um, as I mentioned before, a picture of your teacher or or a picture of a deity that you like to follow, uh, Jesus or Buddha or or uh, Ganapati or you know any of the many 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 symbols that re- that recognize Kundalini or that are that are symbolic of Kundalini. You could even use um, the colors. You can use a color red or blue or, or uh, red and white or blue and white. Uh, can be can be used as a way of, of recognition of kundalini within a devotional context. Uh, you could even use eagles or, or serpents or wolves or any of the the top of you know a, apex predators, top of the food chain predators, uh, are often represented by the kundalini uh, as a way of communicating to the the person having the kundalini that that this is the top of the evolutionary uh, uh, pattern for the human being having kundalini is that that area <clears throat> so as you find yourself um, at your house or, or wherever you are and you feel this this compulsion to put your hands in the prayer position and to to fall on your knees and and bring your forehead to the ground and and really begin to to say words that you know such as I love you Kundalini I I give myself to you Kundalini I you know I give my control of my life over to you Kundalini as you as you do this uh, you begin to merge in a loving way with that force that is expressing within within you and outside of you at the same time. And as a way of uh, example of, of that equation within and without, um, I'm going to suggest that the Kundalini and its energetic radiance that that flows from the seventh chakra and, and forms this this huge uh, circle of intense energy around the person, and then it is spreading for for an enormous level of distance from that person. That would be considered the outside aspect of the Kundalini as it expresses from the inside to the outside. You, from a devotional platform, can 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 have that devotional love for that radiance that it, that you can actually see outside of yourself. Uh, it's it, there, you know. It's all connected. It's all one. But your your bicameral brain may want to make that separation for a a devotional attitude to be experienced and understood. <clears throat> so consider this. Uh, if you're working uh, with a teacher, then the teacher may give you certain instructions. If they know what they're doing with regards to teaching Kundalini, uh, they may give you certain instructions along a devotional standpoint. Um, uh, you know, instructions that from their understanding of, of your process at the time that you're having that process and the level of opening that you have experienced, which indicates that this teacher will know somewhat of your history with the Kundalini, uh, that teacher can give you instruction within certain ways of devotion towards the Kundalini. And in many ways, this starts out as surrender patterns or surrender exercises. And as you as you learn to surrender your ego control, once you surrender that ego control, well, you can bring in that devotional um, expression. You know, one of the one of the main blockages of devotion is from the ego itself. 
uh, oh, what will people think of me if, if they know that I'm uh, giving devotion to this teacher or to this to this statue or to this these you know these 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 colors? I mean, what are people going to think of me? And that you know that unleashes a whole torrent of of uh, you know ridicule, possible ridicule or invalidation, and da 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 da, and it just kind of leads to a downward spiral. And so you really want to bring your ego in check. It doesn't matter what people think of you because nobody's going to be seeing you do this. So so that's an irrational fear that is put upon the person from the ego in order for the ego to maintain a level of control over the person's life and the development within the Kundalini. So you must initiate your control over the ego and and begin to do the devotion. As you do more devotion, then the ego control is less and less and less and less and less until there isn't any uh, real ego control within the, the devotional aspect of a person's life. So as you as you fall on your knees or you prostrate yourself on the ground and and you begin to say your prayers of, of devotion to the kundalini, uh, if you have a kundalini mantra that maybe a teacher has given you or the kundalini itself has given you, you say that mantra over and over and over and over and over. And you'll often be... be given instruction to do things that you wouldn't normally do. Uh, you may be asked to assume certain positions that you wouldn't normally uh, find yourself in. Many of them are, are ancient devotional positions, such as one of the positions of devotion is, uh, is if you're on your hands and your knees, and then instead of being on your hands, you bring yourself down to your forearms uh, with your head kind of looking forward or up, and you're the, with a with an arch in the small of your back, and then your your uh, your knees a little wider than the shoulder length apart, uh, with your feet in an arched position. So so it's not you know if if any of you have taken any of the Japanese martial arts, they'll have you with your feet flat against the ground. Well, with this, your toes are touching the ground, but and so your 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 feet are not flat against the ground. Your toes have the arch. And from there, you're either uh, looking at a picture or you're looking at a statue or you're looking at colors. And as you as you occupy the visual sense, you're also uh, repeating a prayer or a mantra that, that mobilizes the vocal sense and the audio sense because you can hear yourself saying it. Okay, and so with, with this trinity... Of, of effect, in addition to the actual position, uh, this brings on a this this has the possibility of bringing on a very strong uh, devotional response from the Kundalini to you, and uh, so I will I will strongly recommend that anybody within or the Kundalini already or anybody who is is working towards having the Kundalini within. Uh, Adopt uh, this position and some of the other positions uh, that we may discuss later on. Um, devotion is a, is a very, very strong, compressed form of love, giving love to all creation, all divine creation uh, around you. And this serves also as a healing platform. As you're able to establish a, a representation within yourself of devotion, a format of devotion within yourself to the Kundalini, so will the Kundalini begin to expand that devotion into many of the activities that it will be bringing you to do, such as healing. Healing with the Kundalini is already very strong, but when you add devotion to that healing, you you add a level of grace and a level of of power to that healing that really goes beyond my ability to describe uh, yeah i just I just can't really it's the divine is not something that is easily translated into words, so I'll just have to say that that the healing uh is 
is amazingly powerful when a person is in a constant state of devotion. And this also brings up other uh, phenomena associated with the extreme devotional state, which is bliss. Bliss becomes quite common within the devotional experience, as well as ecstasy and the ecstatic uh, areas of expression. And what this is, is this is really the body responding to divine contact. Uh, And if any of you who have had... those of you who have had bliss know what I'm talking about. It it takes you. It just takes you completely. It takes control of you, and and not in a bad way. It's not like you're you know dancing around like a chicken. But it wouldn't matter if you were. Uh, Kundalini, when it takes you within the, the idea of bliss or ecstasy, is oh, once again. Um, The body responds in certain ways, and either through shaking or through uh, squeezing the eyes closed really tight or copious amounts of tears or sobbing or uh, any of the, any of the uh, relief valves that the body has uh, to channel this energy through because it's so strong that uh, the kundalini will force the the relief valves to open so that the body is is not damaged uh, by this amount of energy coming through, and it's not it's not hurtful at all. It feels really really good, but you can only have it for at, at the beginning. Uh, you can only have bliss or ecstasy for a certain short amount of time. What was that? I wonder. That's with me, um, Chris. I'm sorry. Ah, okay. It's my PC oh, yes. doing its thing. Sorry about that. Can, can you put yourself into the blue there, please? Yeah. No, I, I, I've done it now. I see. Okay. Uh, so, um, I just kind of popped me right out of that uh, stream. Sorry. You, uh, you were speaking about so. bliss and, and what it's like and how indescribable it is, actually. Thanks. There are no words. <laughs> okay, so um yeah, with regard to the to the bliss, the, the Kundalini will open forcefully open those valves and uh and allow the energy to stream off uh, into the into the areas around the body. Devotion will bring these these experiences to a person. Uh, and, and, and the nice thing about devotion is it's a voluntary thing to some degree. It's a voluntary thing to some degree. It's involuntary in other ways. So once you're exposed to devotion, then it's something that you don't want to forsake, something that you don't want to just, you know, forget about because, you know, if it's inconvenient or things like that. Now, I understand that if you have a teacher saying, okay, uh, student, uh, I want you to go into that uh, devotional position and I want you to, you know, do your devotions with your mantra for, uh, oh, say, 40 minutes or an hour or something like that. And and if it becomes work like that, then I can see where you might want to, to, you know, create some distance between yourself, at least on an ego level. The ego will go, oh, my God, this is work. I don't want to do this. And, and... From that level, you know, you can develop, you know, some, some, some qualities of resistance to the to the uh, devotion. But if you're really getting into the devotion and 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 not resisting it and and really getting into it, there will be you'll never want to stop. You'll never want to stop with it at all. Uh, as you as you are practicing, uh, I do uh, a form of work with people that that take them into various zones within the Kundalini, and, and uh, if you're doing that kind of work, uh, devotion is is pretty much a a constant quality, a constant quality of expressed and received love, and and the devotion as a carrier wave of love. Uh, focused at a specific uh, concept in this, in, in our concept in this conversation, is the Kundalini. 
I would like to uh, uh, give you the call-in numbers if you'd like to call in for those of, uh, who are listening live. Uh, I think I will be keeping the 3 o'clock time period uh, as it it works well. It's it, and it's part of that whole Kundalini sacred mathematics that that maybe we can do another show on. Uh, so three o'clock in the afternoon at the Pacific Standard Time is is the time that uh, I think I will be keeping, unless other things you know jump out or you know for some reason uh, I'm unable to be by myself uh, during the three o'clock time. That call-in number for our program is. Uh, and I guess this is an area code. It's in it's in uh, parameters here. So area code three four seven nine three four zero zero two six. That's area code three four seven nine three four zero zero two six. So if if any of you have a question or a comment and would like to call in, then I would like to invite you to do so. And, Cruzan, can I say something about that as well? You can actually ring that number from any country um, on Skype um, if you have credit. And it's it's really so cheap. It's almost oh. free. There you have it. There you have it, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Because I'm actually on Skype and I'm phoning in, and it, it's really it's fantastic. So anybody can phone in from any country. There you have it, folks. So. I want you to feel free. Now, I've given you the new time period that we'll be broadcasting the show. And so if you if you have Kundalini now and you are in a, in a perplexed or confused uh, uh, state of mind with regards to having it, or you just want more because you're, you're uh, exploring the idea of awakening the Kundalini, well, then call in on that number. And here's the number again. It's 347-934-934. 0026. Uh, Amelia, do you have anything to say about your experiences with devotion? Oh, wow. <laughs> well, devotion is, you know, it, it's so central to my life. I mean, it is interwoven really in everything that I do. I mean, when I had my um, Kundalini awakening event, devotion, I was on my knees for days and days and days. And then that faded. And and I suppose, you know, there's the devotion that comes in a spontaneous way. As you said, I, I could be in my kitchen and I go into spontaneous devotion. I will go down on my knees. I will, you know, I, oh, it's very hard to describe. But there is also the devotion that I would do that I suppose is planned or it is um, where I take time to be devotional, where I cultivate or I, or I foster that that love that I have for Kundalini, you know, where the union with God, with Kundalini, occurs in a time that I give it. So the two things, like, it's happening all the time. You don't have to be anywhere in particular or doing anything in particular to be devotional, but you also can create, it's an attitude really. I suppose it's an attitude of my spirit now to be in devotion all the time. Um, yeah, I've, yeah. <laughs> that, that attitude, thank you, thank you, that, that, uh, that's, that's a very appropriate, um, you know, an excellent uh, um, explanation of, of how it's working for you. And I think, and, and, and really, you're, you're absolutely correct. It is an attitude that becomes you in a way. Uh, just as the Kundalini is a path that walks the person walking the path, so does the attitude of devotion begin to express through the person all the time, as as uh, Santara suggested. So when you do have that communication with your kundalini from a devotional state, your radiance is magnified tremendously, uh, tremendously. And I, I hate to give you physical dimensions, but it, they're they're quite large. Um, you begin to to attract more uh, creation to your 
uh, to your kundalini equation. You you begin to attract more phenomena, more um, uh, explicit physical response, um, more response from from other people, from from animals, insects, fish, uh, more response from the the etheric regions of of, of the astral. Uh, the radiance is like a level of light that that isn't so common in expression on this world, uh, and so it attracts a lot of interest. And many beings that are even considering taking a human body as an expressive vehicle on this earth, you know, will look at a at a at a person having the kundalini. Uh, you know, with the devotion and, and begin to learn what it is, you know, to do this, what it is to have this body and to have the, the kundalini dormant in the body for a certain number of lifetimes and then to have that flower bloom with the kundalini and with the love that is that is uh, incorporated within the devotion and uh, how this this takes one into an ascension platform that is quite, quite profound quite profound so devotion is, is as I mentioned at the beginning of the broadcast a very important very big step uh, towards uh, at oneness with the divine and it is also a, a very important step of surrender you know in, in, in some contexts with, with the kundalini you could see devotion and surrender as being synonymous with each other. Uh, they mean almost the same thing. Uh, surrender is more of a of an acute uh, control vector over the ego, forcing the ego, which is a big deal here in the West, uh, where you know everybody is basically living their life from their ego. So as you as you uh, surrender your ego control over your life and your life's choices, uh, you, as you do that over and over, you begin to, to bring in levels of devotion, levels of connectivity to the divine source that is once again inside you and outside of you at the same time. You might just imagine a horseshoe or a U, an upside down U, where you know the base of your spine coming out the top of your head arcing over uh, in front of you is this this energetic um, symbol of of the of the outside qualities of the kundalini as well even within an energetic state almost like lightning uh, when I was younger and, and I was experiencing a, uh, a kundalini phenomena when I was a child um, I would see uh, huge balls of lightning <clears throat> occur maybe, you know, three, four feet in front of me. It's, you know, it was it was amazing to see, but you know, my mother just could not handle it. It's like, you know, she didn't know what to say. <laughs> you got to feel sorry for her with that. It's like, what, <laughs> what, what, did, what did my strange child experience this time? Um, so, so yeah, with with the devotion, you really give a level of expression and and feeling and love into your kundalini equation that will displace the levels of fear and uncertainty that you may have experienced uh, up to that point. Love displaces fear. Love displaces uncertainty. Because the love and the devotion is so clear and so certain and so centered that fear, which is a which is a quality of the ego, uh, is not allowed to intervene after you reach a certain level of devotion. Now, as you're reaching those levels, yes, 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 you may, you, you know, you'll have this this push and pull effect with your ego. Your ego will want the control, and if you don't let it control, well, then all of a sudden this becomes boring. Or all of a sudden this is just like, oh, this isn't real. And, you know, all the different excuses will come up against, uh, you know, 
doing the devotion. Oh, this is, this this teacher, he just wants you to pray at his feet, or this this statue, well, that's just religion. And, you know, many, 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 many different excuses uh, will come to the fore of the person who is, who is in resistance to uh, releasing the ego from its dominant position within the decision-making process of the person. So you really want to do that, though. You want to push the ego out of its control spot with how you make your choices and decisions in your life. Uh, the ego, I'd never say kill the ego or obliterate the ego or any of these things, but I do say take its control over how you are away. Okay? And this allows the ego to learn. Ego is the equivalent of a 10 or 12 year old child. And so, it, you know, when you take it out of the control seat, you allow it to observe and to learn. And uh, in the Huna sense, if, you, if you're familiar with any of the Huna teachings, uh, as espoused through uh, Max Freedom Long, and he's the only person I will suggest that you listen to with regards to the, the Huna, and, and by that I mean reading his books. Um, as the ego is pushed out of the control seat, it learns what it needs to learn to become a middle self, or a, in the Polynesian term, the Uhane. And then the Uhane, of course, which is where you, who are listening to this right now, are, the Uhane becomes Amakua, which is the divine, or God, within the, uh, within the Huna understanding. So you push the ego out of the control seat, you make sure that it doesn't get to have its agenda honored as you're uh, as you're within your your kundalini context and as you do that uh you become able to surrender yourself you become able to give of yourself you become able to trust the process without going into fear of ridicule or fear of of uh, a phenomena or fear of any sort, you are being given an opportunity to really experience the, 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 the power of love, the power of love through expressed devotion. So you find yourself on your knees with your hands in prayer position and you, you find the, 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 the hands going from the heart to the head to the top of the head and opening. You find uh, your, your, your fingers in the Kundalini Mudra. You find yourself prostrating yourself down and saying whatever mantra, if you're given a mantra to say, and then coming up and doing the whole thing over. And, and as you do this over and over and over, if you look at it from the outside in, you'll see that your spine is pumping more Kundalini up just by virtue of the prostration, the repeated prostration that's occurring. It's the action of the hips, the action of the spine, the action of the legs and the arms, they all are working in a, in a synchronistic expression of bringing the energy up, bringing the energy up to the top of the head and out, up to a specific chakra in the body, enervating that chakra, energizing that chakra, and moving throughout the... Uh, the energetic vascular system of the human body, spreading the transformation, adding to the transformation, assisting the transformation through love. Through love, this is occurring. Through the devotion, the, the, the projected surrender through love that a person has for their kundalini process. And this, once again, as I've mentioned, becomes amplified tremendously. And as Amelia mentioned, uh, it will happen all the time after a while. After a certain amount of, of practice of, of, of surrendering the ego control and getting into this place where, where the devotion is quite strong, you will find that it happens all the time. There's never a time when you're not feeling and expressing that surrendered love to the kundalini, that devotional love to the kundalini. And this will often translate 
into worship, worshiping of the Kundalini. And, you know, some of you, you know, they've they got a problem with that worship word there. And, uh, and you know, I, it's not the same as as what you would see in a church or at a temple or anything like that. This is something that is coming from within you, from the base, the base of your spine, out the top of your head. And this is the direction that the worship is coming, is being given to. It's being given to the divine, yes, but the divine as an extension of itself through you. The divine as an extension of itself through you. And so, in a way, it is divinity worshiping divinity. And remember, I am talking within the kundalini context. To those that have awakening kundalini or those who are who are, are approaching uh, having their kundalini activated through whatever means. Okay. Now, as you know, as we get into the idea of different means of of uh, activating the kundalini, uh, one of one way that that happens, uh, you know, fairly commonly in the West, is uh, through the use of entheogens or through the use of of uh, uh, naturally occurring herbs or or uh, or you know life forms that are already here on this planet, like mushrooms, uh, certain types of mushrooms, Amanita muscara or or any of the other uh, mushrooms that crush blue, uh, psilocybic mushrooms. Uh, these have the possibility of initiating kundalini. I don't recommend it. It can be quite painful and quite debilitating, confusing, and, and and fearful, but I know some people are going to go there, and so I do need to mention it. Another vector of, of activation through the natural world is ayahuasca, which is uh, the tea that is that is taken from the ayahuasca plant and the uh, the uh, shikruna leaves mixed together in, in water. This also has the ability to activate the kundalini and. Uh, if you're going to go this route, please begin to initiate devotional levels towards the Kundalini before you even do it. If you, if for some reason you, you have to take, this is called the short path. If you're going to take the short path, which is also one of the most dangerous paths, uh, then then I'm going to suggest that you you begin to initiate a devotional pattern of expression before your kundalini is awakened so that after it is awakened, you will at least have that tool to be able to, to ground yourself with. Once again, I do not, and I strongly uh, do not recommend you take the short path. Already, already just... Just practicing the safety. You don't need chemicals. You don't need different chemicals, you know, to bond to your neurotransmitter or, your, or, or you know, receptors in your brain in order to 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 reach a, an alpha state in order to be conducive to Kundalini awakening. You can just do the practices. Sometimes going fast, you know, can be can be injurious to a person. So I'll, I will never suggest that a person do that. It's not to say that I'm against it. Heck, I've, I've done both of those methods myself. You know, and 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 the first time I did one of the methods, and I won't say which, uh, I didn't have the Kundalini activated yet, and everything went fine. So, and it didn't activate me either. It wasn't. I didn't even know to to look for that. I was just using these things recreationally. The ayahuasca, on the other hand, you know, I did have the kundalini, so I did have a very, a very strong uh, uh, understanding of what I was looking for within within the tea. So uh, you need to understand that the short path can be very damaging, but your devotion can save you. Your devotion can save you. Now, they do have medical terms for people that are overly devotional. 
Yes. Yes, that is a condition. Um, and I think we covered it a little bit uh, last week with the OCD. It's just like, oh, this person's becoming too spiritual. They're developing too great of a relationship with their idea of the divine than, than the medical community is comfortable with. And I'm just going to say, don't do it in front of them. Don't do it in front of people who don't understand what it is you're doing. Don't practice devotion in front of others if you can help it. Now, if you're just standing there and you're you're in devotion kind of quietly to yourself as you're in line at the grocery store or putting gas in your car or, you know, attending a, uh, you know, a social event, well, that's fine. That's one thing. You know, just so that nobody really knows what you're doing. But if you start falling on your knees and prostrating yourself here in the West, they're going to consider that a real. They're going to have a problem with that, and and they may initiate a, a, a intervention. And the last thing anybody with Kundalini needs is a medical intervention of, of psychotherapeutic uh, uh, resemblance. And so, don't go into devotion in front of people who won't understand what it is you're doing or who are dead set against it. You know, there are plenty of atheists out there who just do not agree with anything of a devotional you know, quality. That It smacks of religion to them and and the religious uh, history of this earth is is not the, the most positive one and I understand that and I get that. I wasn't raised religious either, you know. My mother made us go to church on uh, Easter and Christmas just to learn manners. <laughs> you can see what kind of a kid I was, huh? Uh, so, so yeah, uh, try not to be devotional in front of other people who don't understand. Um, I will suggest that you go to a private place. Create a private space in your home. Uh, use your car in some ways as a as a as a private space but don't be devotional while you're driving uh, as i mentioned with uh, bliss bliss will often close your eyes ecstasy will close your eyes and closing your eyes while you're driving 65 miles an hour down a freeway not a good plan not a good plan so don't do it while you're driving if you if you feel the urge to go into devotion while you are driving pull over somewhere, stay in the car, and, you know, go into devotion, uh, but try to, you know, try to do it in a way that doesn't cause alarm to other people. And and once again, the kundalini will bring this on, too. But once again, as I've discussed in other programs, kundalini is smart. It's a smart, intelligent, conscious force. And so it knows you're driving. you're driving and so you know it probably won't bring that on but I remember one experience where I was uh, I had uh, I think I was reading Gopi Krishna's uh, book it was early on in my experience and uh, I was experimenting with asking the Kundalini to bring the sacred feminine up and in her extreme cold uh, state and uh, and of course I was driving down Highway 12 at about 55 miles an hour, and uh, in in a car that didn't belong to me. It was a company car. And uh, wow, the Kundalini started the Sacred Feminine coming up. I couldn't believe I was feeling cold to the point of molten cold, uh, beginning to to rise uh, up the front. Uh, channels of my body and wow that scared me that scared me I pulled that car over and I I asked the Kundalini (laughs) maybe this wasn't the best time (laughs) for me to be doing (laughs) that and it (laughs) and it and it turned it down you know you could actually feel the uh, the intense gosh that goes beyond words that level it's like you know, below liquid nitrogen, I can only imagine. Uh, and I and and you could actually feel that that temperature recede, and 
and a normal uh, temperature uh, be you know replace it. And so, yeah, doing any of this work while you're driving is very important. You need to have the there's a time and a place, and behind the wheel is not the time or the place. Okay. Um, now I drive you know I, I drive a lot and. Uh, so I'm behind the wheel quite a bit. I have Kundalini, and I have it all the time, and I have it in the devotional state. And so what will happen is I'll just pull over at a rest stop or at a place where I feel that the vehicle and myself will be safe from, from being bothered by people. And then I can go into devotion. Then I can have the bliss and the ecstasy and take the time to properly recover from it. And then, you know, try, you know, Turn the key in the ignition and and continue my drive. Uh, but you know that I've had this for over 23 years and I've had practice with doing that. Not everybody does. Okay. Uh, sometimes uh, devotion will bring about qualities of extreme emotional. Uh, response to your daily life. Uh, all of a sudden you might be in tears or all of a sudden somebody will say something to you and it may be just a casual thing that they're saying to you, but it will affect you in a deep, deep, deep way and it will change your mood uh, for a matter of hours. You won't be able to let go of it. You'll just be chewing on it, chewing on it, chewing on it. And uh, within this context, I'm going to suggest that forgiveness and devotion be be practiced equally if, if you're around other people. They don't know what they're saying. They just don't know what they're saying. And they and, and in many cases they don't know that they're saying it to a Kundalini awakened person. Okay, this Kundalini awakening person has uh senses that are extremely fine extremely expanded and in some you know certainly within the beginning context of a, of an of an awakening uh the nerves are somewhat raw uh, there so you have to be careful about your emotional body and how you receive information or stimulus from from those around you who are not kundalini activated or awakening and one of the best things you can do is if if you're in a social context and somebody says something that may press a few buttons on you, just forgive it immediately. Forgive it immediately. And let that forgiveness be your focal point for a time. Very important. This way you don't lose friends. This way you you know, you you, you just have to understand that one, you're having kundalini, and two, forgiveness is a vector of of decompression for the emotional body. And as you may experience somebody saying this or that, or you see somebody doing this or that, uh, you immediately forgive them and go right back into your devotion. Go right back into your devotion. As Sintara mentioned earlier, you know, devotion is with you all the time for a while. And this is so. This is true. You recognize and see and hear and touch uh, love in, in, in its many, many, many different facets of the jewel that love is. And with the Kundalini, you, you just have access to a lot more of those facets in that jewel than a person who doesn't have the Kundalini awake. So as you experience those... Yeah. I was going to say there, Chris, of, you know, in, in my day, or my body is a living worship to the divine Kundalini as well. You know, it's a living worship. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a living expression. Yeah. Worship yeah. to the divine. And and it becomes that way. Uh, and thank you. Thank you, Sitar, for bringing that. It's absolutely true. Take it down to the cellular level. Uh, everything is working towards your ascension platform in your body. Your cells are all getting getting along with each other, you know, except for those of you that have cancer cells, and they're, you know, they can be turned around. By the way, a cure for cancer really 
devotional kundalini. But the cells are all agreeing with each other. The, the, the cells on up to the major organs are all in agreement with each other. They're all working hard. And, and, you know, if we go into science, genetic science has proven that each cell in the human body has the, the capacity for growing an entire human body from that one cell and the dividing force of that one cell. So each cell has the potential for, a, you, know, a, a, you know, a 20 trillion cell human body. And yet they agree that, oh, okay, I'm a skin cell, so I'm just, I'm going to be here, I'm going to make the skin work as best I can, and I'm going to get along with all the other skin cells and the hair cells and the follicle cells and, you know, the bloodstream, the whole bit. Everybody is in agreement. Everybody is working to keep your body healthy and alive and to have the kundalini flow through it. Kundalini is the connective force, energetic force, and love is a part of that kundalini connective force that holds your body together. Love is the glue. Okay. Love is that powerful force. And when you're giving your devotion to the kundalini, you're acknowledging that force and you're going into that flow, into a harmonic flow of love with the kundalini, with the divine, all the time. And your body becomes as, as, as Sintara suggested, a constant uh, worship in progress. A constant worship in progress. And, you know, I, don't want, to, I want you to consider this. Consider this as a real potential for you, for those of you that have the Kundalini and those of you that are looking to have the Kundalini. Bring devotion into a very, very positive validated practice by yourself. Okay. Don't be fooled by your ego saying, oh, it's just too embarrassing, or oh, I already have the kundalini. I don't need that. Right? Because your kundalini can just stop at a certain level, and that's all you get. You know, some of the martial artists, you know, they, they'll you know, they'll practice with their chi so much that, you know, they'll get a an activation of the kundalini, but because you know, so much of, of the martial arts are into competition and and or defending themselves against an attacker or taking advantage of an opponent. And, you know, it's kind of a, a weapons in war type scenario, uh, competitive scenario. Uh, the Kundalini will stop at a certain level, you know. And it's not a guarantee. I'm not saying that about all martial artists. I'm just saying that generally speaking, yeah, yeah. Until you're able to move out of the competitive venue, uh, the, the fight or flee venue, uh, and then you know you'll be at a certain level, and but that level is also training you perhaps to go out of those of those uh, attitudes. So yeah, you become a walking, talking center of worship in your body, and all your cells do. And, and uh, it realigns the people around you as well. They'll feel that devotion. Your pets, your animals, your plants will feel that devotion. Let that be. That is a good thing. That is a good thing. And generally, your demeanor will will improve incredibly. I mean, if you are a grouchy person, depressed person, and you start practicing devotion, you become a much happier person. A much happier person. If you're a if you're a person that goes up in front of uh, groups of people every day, like say a teacher does, uh, uh, a teacher goes up and and she stands in front of a group of people every day. Those people, by virtue of of being within her radiance will be able to partake of her devotion. They won't know it. They won't know it, but because they're focused on what she is saying and what she is doing and what she's demonstrating, uh, they partake of of her devotion. So in a way, she is giving people a healing every day she goes to work. Uh, a, a teacher, a bus driver, 
a corporate boss, a lawyer, a police officer, a farmer, I mean, you name it. Whatever profession that person is in, when you have kundalini that is supported through your devotion of the kundalini, they partake of that love. And they just have a better day for it. A better day. And in some cases, you know, a healing takes place for them. Now, let's see. Looks like we have a few people online. So I'm going to put out the numbers again if anybody wants to call or ask a question or make a comment. The area code is 347-934-0026. 347-934-0026. I welcome anybody who wants to call and, and make a comment. Um, with regard to devotion and the practice of devotion, um, I encourage you to to take care of all accoutrements of the ego uh your jewelry your watches your you know do it in as clean a way as you can take a shower first take a shower first try not to get your head wet um take a shower first and be explicit in your cleansing you're washing off the traces of ego you're washing off uh, the life that you live through the auspices of the ego and you come down into that special place, that special room, closet, whatever, where where you have maybe put a little bit of a temple there, a little altar with, with a picture or something that that allows you to focus on the kundalini within you and you spend some time on your knees and forearms or just in a seated position saying a mantra or or you know, singing a song silently to yourself, or saying words that that allow you to express your devotion to the Kundalini through whatever offices, through the offices of a religion or of a, of a teacher, or from the offices of the Kundalini itself. It's all good. It's all good. Remember, once you have Kundalini, you have uh, endless opportunities of self-discovery. And some of those self-discoveries can be facilitated by a teacher or by a religion uh, or by the kundalini, but you get to kind of choose what you're most comfortable with at the time that you do it. And the ego will have some influence on what it is you do, how you do it, but that's just in the process of you uh, learning what it is to release the ego from control. The ego is part of this process. The release you have to be able to release something in order to open something. Okay. Uh you turn the door knob on a door in order to open the door. Or you actually have to push it to open. And so with the ego you push it aside in order to enter the room of Kundalini devotion. I wish I could uh, bring more of this experience into words, but ecstasy and bliss just do not function within a verbal process. I mean, for those of you that have it, you know what I did. You know what I mean. Um, for those of you that don't, I hope you do. I hope you do get to have this. Um, I didn't do this at the beginning of the program, and so I would like to do it right now. Um, I would like to thank the O'Connor family for arranging uh, for this blog talk uh, radio station to exist. Uh, uh, John O'Connor and, and his wife and their children uh, in the uh, in the kingdom of Kerry. Uh, I would like to thank you all. I would like to thank Eileen Laurel for her help and, and assistance in the many different ways we try to get the Kundalini awakening information out into the masses. So thank you, Eileen. I'd like to thank uh, uh, Amelia Santara for her countless hours of uh, of work and, and, and uh, activities that she gives into her community, such as Kundalini Integrated Therapeutic Touch, which is another program. Uh, uh, Santara has this. She has the ability to initiate uh, kundalini uh, 
healings uh, through her integrated therapeutic touch. And uh, this is something that uh, that I can discuss in another program if people are interested in hearing about it. Uh, so uh, at this point, I would like to to repeat the other other places that we have this Kundalini information coming through. One place I didn't re- uh, mention at the beginning of the show uh, is an important place uh, to to see this disembodied voice that you've been listening to. Uh, if you go to Chrism and then Zero and then Kundalini, it, looks, it should look on your on your search browser like Chrism O Kundalini on YouTube. And I have about 223 videos there, and I suggest you watch all of them. Uh, you know, one a day. You know, I really just kind of look at it and begin to learn about this potential within you. Kundalini is the strongest energetic form that a human being can have while still having a body. It's very, very, very strong. Okay. And and it doesn't have to hurt you. I know the expectation is there. I know if you go on the web and you look at Kundalini syndrome or Kundalini dangers or something like that, you're going to come up with all kinds of different really terrible stories uh, that exist with regards to the Kundalini. But it does not have to be that way. If you take fear out of the equation, things go much smoother. And yes, 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 you know, this is easy to hear. Easy to hear, easy to talk about, easy to discuss within a protective ego-encased environment. But when it happens to you, that's a different deal. Having is very different than wanting or just talking about. Having, you know, when you start to feel the pressure at the base of your spine and you feel your, you know, your organs begin to expand and you feel energy shooting up your spine out the top of your head, you feel your eyes roll up as if they want to roll into the back of your head, your tongue goes up behind the upper front teeth, your fingers go into automatic mudras, you start assuming different positions that you've never heard of before, didn't know they were yoga, but all you all of a sudden discover they're yoga. Well, all of that adds up to a very different experience than what you're used to having. And fear is easy to develop within that within that uh, understanding. So take the fear out. Educate yourself. If you're even listening to this to this radio uh, broadcast, you under you know there's something in you that is calling you into this into this information. It's not common information. So something in you is triggering your and if you you know if you've made it this far, you know listening to, <laughs> listening to my voice this far, you know something is definitely working within you for you to have this information and not just to store it away but to act on it in some way. Uh, so this may be your time to really look into a Kundalini awakening. And if that is something that you're interested in doing, then I'm going to suggest that you come to the to the uh, retreat uh, in Santa Rosa on April 20th and 21st and uh, talk to uh, uh, Amelia Santara at uh, kundalinimatters at gmail.com or Eileen Laurel uh, uh, at uh, E L O R O five five at yahoo dot com, and talk to those two lovely ladies, and uh, you know, begin to arrange for yourself to to come into this to this area. Uh, begin to practice the safeties that you'll find on the Kundalini Awakening Systems One dot com site. Go to the menu on the left-hand side. It's, I think, the fourth selection down. It's called Safeties. Begin to practice those every day, and you'll find elements of devotion in those protocols. Practice that devotion. Don't be afraid to get on your knees. Don't be afraid to initiate a worshipful, uh, loving, uh, prayerful, relationship with your kundalini even before it begins to express itself 
don't be afraid to do this. Let this occur. This is a natural part of who you are. Kundalini is dormant in the tailbones of every single person on this world. Your body is wired to have it. So have it. Have it and and begin to feel the grace that comes to you and then augment that grace with your devotion. Augment that grace with your devotion. So go to the YouTube channel and and watch all the different videos or the ones that you're called to watch um, and, and begin to learn about yourself. Begin to learn about yourself. Uh, The next show that we're going to have will be uh, a week from today, and we'll be talking about Kundalini and dreams. And and in some of that, I'm going to go through the language of Kundalini as well, because the Kundalini has its own language uh, that that you can partake of, that you can listen to and, and communicate with and learn from. In many ways, Kundalini will come to a person in the dream state and give very, very specific teachings to the person. So that's next week's show. Um, uh, Sintara, do you have anything to add to this one? Well, um, I suppose, you know, the Kundalini within is what sparked the worship um, for me, you know, from the innermost, innermost part of me. Um, But also... It is up to me to also cultivate and um, give time to that. So, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Chrism. Thank you. Thank you. And then, then, absolutely, the Kundalini will spark the devotion in you. It will. Don't resist that. Uh, but also, uh, nourish it within yourself by just starting yeah. on your own. You know, you have to... You have to, to to kind of create the environment for yourself too. This is just just yeah. it's a way of creating an an ease with it. It's not required. The Kundalini will do it. But uh to to bring yourself into a greater facility with it, well then you can begin to practice it already. And you'll notice that many people in the Eastern uh understanding like Hinduism or Taoism or or any of the uh, Buddhist practices will will pray in a devotional context or chant in a devotional context. Om Nyom Renge Kyo or any of the different uh, uh, chants that you'll find uh, in, in the Eastern understandings. Uh, you know, so I really, I, you know, I want to go uh, online right now and and bless the Eastern traditions for, for being, one, so well maintained, and two, uh, giving a you know a level of information about uh, the the uh, Kundalini and, and a person's relation to the divinity in a very uh, plausible and and real option for people to consider. So hats off to all of you in the East. Uh, and with that, I would like to say thank you for listening. Uh, thank you for those who have listened live. As we're as we're recording this, and thank you to all of you who are listening in the future in the archives. Goodbye. Bye.